All right, so we're going to do our first lesson today over derivatives. So we're going to learn what a derivative is, um, and we're going to define a derivative using a limit. So this is why we cover limits first, because everything else we do in this class has a definition that involves a limit. All right, so derivatives are a, a rate of change. All right, so that's what this whole first page is about, talking about rates of change, um, the relationship between two changing quantities. Okay, a familiar example is velocity. Okay, so if an object is traveling in a straight line, then you can find its average velocity by calculating its change in position divided by its change in time. Okay, you may recognize a formula that looks kind of similar to this, all right, that we'll see down below. All right, so for an example of driving a car, if we drive a car 200 miles in four hours, then the average velocity is 200 over four, which is 50 miles per hour. All right, that does not let us know how fast we were going at any given moment in time. Okay, that just gives us an average, all right? At any minute, we could have been going 75 miles an hour. We could have been stopped at a red light going zero miles per hour. Okay, so all we're doing is finding an average. We're not able to find a velocity at a moment in time, or at least you haven't been yet. All right, so that velocity at, at a specific moment in time, we call the instantaneous velocity. Okay, we can't define this as a ratio because the denominator would be a zero. The time difference at, an, at a single instant uh, would be a zero, okay? So that's why you haven't been able to do this in your previous classes because that would be um, something that you're not allowed to do, dividing by zero, all right? So what, we're, what we do in, in calculus is we're, we're gonna be able to find this value, all right? And it's not gonna be dividing by zero. All right, we're gonna go through a process Okay, and that process is going to be we're going to estimate the instantaneous velocity by computing the average velocity over smaller and smaller intervals. All right, which will eventually have the intervals get closer and closer and closer to zero. All right, so let's see what we're talking about here on a graph. So this is a graph right here, and um, we're going to draw a secant line. So a secant line is a line that goes through two points. All right, hold on a second. All right, so a secant line is a line that goes through two points. So we have two points right here. This point right here is T1, and so its S value will be S of T1. And then this point here is at T2, and its S value would be at S of T2. Okay, in a secant line would just be me drawing a line connecting those two points together. All right, the real, the real thing connecting those two points is a curve. We're drawing a line, and this line, whatever the slope of this line is, is the average rate of change. S, S of T2 minus S of T1 over T2 minus T1. Same formula we just saw up here. All right, and so what, what we're going to do with this is we're going to move the secant line so that T2 gets closer to T1. So we're going to start moving T2 closer and closer and closer and closer, all right? And eventually that, that distance between them is gonna be so small, it's basically gonna be zero. And every time we move T2, the, the Y value changes as well. So we get that and we would draw a new secant line. I'm not gonna draw all the secant lines because that would get, uh, we wouldn't be able to see them very well, but you can imagine what they would look like. And then I put T2 here and I draw another secant line. Then I put T2 here and I draw another secant line put T2 here and I draw another secant line. And eventually that distance gets so small, it's basically zero and we're basically right on top of that point, all right? And the slope of that line, which would be the slope of a tangent line, it would no longer be a secant line. It would only cross through one point. It would be the tangent line, which looks like that. Tangent line touches at that point, which is at T1 right here. Um, whatever the slope of that line is, that's the instantaneous velocity at that time okay so that's that's the calculus right there all right you've never been able to do this before calculate the instantaneous rate of change of something okay so velocity is just one example of this it's a nice convenient example because you can visualize how that works you've all ridden in cars before and you know about speed and stuff like that okay but this can work for just any regular function all right instead of velocity let's just call our our function y all right and so we do the change in y over the change in x all right, and we just say that's the average rate of change. All right, if I want the instantaneous rate of change at x equals x1, then I would just move the x2 closer and closer and closer to x1 until you're so close that the distance between them is basically zero. OK, 
Okay, expressions like these, these are called difference quotients. Difference quotients are very important. Um, there will be many times where you're asked to approximate an instantaneous rate of change. And the way you do that is by finding an average rate of change. And they'll say, show the computations that lead to your answer. And what they want to see when they say that is a difference quotient. Okay, we'll talk about that more when we start um, looking at free response questions. All right, so the instantaneous rate of change of a function is called its derivative. Okay, another word that you should always be thinking of when we're talking about derivatives, you learn this word along with rate of change back in your Algebra 1 class, and you've talked about it in every class since then, I hope. Rate of change is the same thing as slope. Okay, so derivative is slope. All right, just have that connection in your brain. Derivative is slope. All right, so these two definitions, got to know them. Okay, this is the formal definition of derivative. The word isn't written here, so I'm going to write it. Formal definition of derivative. So the derivative of f of x at x equals c is the limit of the difference quotients if it exists. So f prime, that's what that little notation right there is. That's a prime symbol, and that's how we um, denote derivative. So f prime is the derivative of f. The derivative of f. All right, is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay, I feel like this formula just kind of comes out of nowhere um, and it's hard to conceptualize without a picture. So let's draw a picture. Okay, so we're going to imagine that we have a point at x right there. And so we'll, see, we'll put the point, say, right there. And then the y value of that point would be f of x. All right, this is the f function. This is the x-axis. All right, and then we're going to have another point over here somewhere. Okay, now I'm not going to name that point yet. Okay, this h is the confusing part, I think. So notice how it's written here, x plus h. So if you can think of h as a distance... That would be this distance between our two points. That's h. And so if I had to put a name on this point over here, I could say it's x plus h because we're going that far over. And then let's say that point's located right there. And then if I plug that in, I would get f of x plus h. Okay, and then remember what we're doing is we're finding an average rate of change. So draw a line between these two points. And my function could be anything, right? My function could be crazy. It could be going like this and like this and like that. Okay, it doesn't matter what the function looks like. Okay, we are thinking of what is the slope between those two points right there, if I just draw a line. All right, so that slope would be, I'll write it up here, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by x plus h minus x, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And then you can simplify. The numerator is going to stay the same. Denominator, the x here, cancels with a negative x, leaving us with h. That's where that comes from. That's the, that's the average rate of change. So what, what about this limit? Well, remember what we just talked about. Okay, the average rate of change is just a regular slope. You've been doing that since Algebra 1. We want to find a calculus slope. So we want maybe the slope right at this point. And if this blue function was my function, it would be something that looks like that, a tangent line like that. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this point closer and closer and closer. And look what's happening to H as I do that. H is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually H approaches zero. So that's where that limit comes from. We want to let that distance between the two points approach zero. And then that'll allow us to find the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, now this there's a problem here because if I plug in zero for h, I get a zero. Okay, that would be f of x minus f of x. And then I get a zero on the bottom. So this is a zero over zero limit. Okay, and so when we have an actual function to deal with, we'll be able to deal with that problem um, using some algebra techniques and things we learned in our last unit for solving limits. Okay, uh, when this limit exists, so if we're able to solve it and we get an answer, when this limit exists, we say that f is differentiable, all right? f is differentiable. Differentiable is a fancy word for mean, has a derivative. 
at x equals c. So derivatives can exist at specific points on the graph. Okay, an equivalent definition of derivative is called the alternative form of the definition of derivative. So you'll notice a couple differences here. One, there's a c instead of an x. Okay, you want to use this mostly when you want to do a derivative at a point. And you may not understand what that means yet, but you will soon. So you want to use this when you want the derivative at a point. This one up here, you want the derivative. Sorry, let me spell it right. Derivative as a function. And again, it's okay if you don't understand that exactly right now. You'll definitely understand it after we do a, a few examples. All right, hold on a second. All right, so basically what this means is that um, you're plugging in actual number. C is a constant. All right, let's write that over here. C is a constant. So this will be like f prime of 2. And so the way you do that one is instead of an h, you have the limit as x approaches c. So that could be like a 2. And then you have f of x minus f of c over x minus c. All right? We'll draw a picture of this one as well. Bell's about to ring, so I'll have to pause and come back later. All right, I am back. And uh, we were talking about the alternative form of the definition of derivative. And I want to draw out a graph kind of similar to the one we did up there. I'll do this one a little smaller. So instead of having an x and then an x plus h, we just have an x and a c. So I'm going to put the c in the, the left spot right there. And so whatever point I plot, that'll give us my f of c. And then I'll put my x over here. And whatever point I plot for that will give me my f of x. So when we, again, the function could be just anything between here. I'll draw a simpler one this time. Let's try to connect them. Okay, um, but when we're doing this, we're, we're just finding the average rate of change, which is the slope between those two points, and then we are letting x approach c. So we're sending x this direction, closer and closer and closer and closer until it's exactly the same as c, and then when that happens, we should have the slope of a tangent line at that point right there. All right, let's put this into practice. So we have a diver that is jumping off a diving board that is 32 feet above the water. The position of the diver from the water is given by this function where T is measured in seconds. Uh, graph this function on your graphing calculator and sketch the result below. All right, let me get my calculator pulled up here. <clears throat> this is a function we could actually graph not too, wouldn't be too hard to graph by hand because the numbers are pretty nice to work with, 16 and 32, those go together nicely. But we'll go ahead All right, so I'm going to add a graph here. I'm going to type in our function, negative 16. I have to use x in the calculator, plus 16x plus 32. All right, so I can see a bit of the graph here. I would like to be able to see my, my vertex, which is going to be up here somewhere, right? Divers going, going up and then down. Um, and then I don't want my x-axis to be very much right here. In fact, I can start at 0 since uh, t is positive for this problem. So I'm gonna go to menu, I'm gonna go to window, zoom, and window settings. Okay, you could zoom in, zoom out, but I like to just do my settings myself. Um, I know I want my X to be zero, and then it just looked like it was like two right there. So I'm gonna put three for my X max. All right, Y min, I can go with zero again there. Um, I do sometimes like to go a little less than just so I can get a little a room to see. So I'm gonna go negative one. And I'm actually going to go back up to x min and put that as negative 1 as well. All right, and then y max, I don't know exactly what the max is. Um, 32 is the y-intercept. We can get that from the equation. Um, and then I'm thinking it goes up a little more. So let's try 50. If that's not enough, we can change it. All right, I think we're good. So um, there's my y-intercept. He goes up and down, and he hits right there. All right, 32. Diver goes up and down and hits here, which we'll find that point in a minute. All right, find the average velocity, um, which is the average rate of change at which the diver is moving for the time interval 1 to 1.5. Okay, so we can say like t equals 1 right there. 
let's go ahead and find that point. It's bothering me that I'm not saying what it is. So I could do it on the calculator or we can do it by hand. I'll show you both ways. So on the calculator, you go to menu, analyze graph, and then zero. And we're finding the zero right here. So we're gonna click on the left and the right. So it's X equals two or T equals two. All right, so one's here right there. And uh, one's going to be right there. It's actually exactly 32. I just I remember this from before. So I'm going to draw it a little bigger just so it looks like it's 32. I, I didn't draw my parabola very well, apparently. All right. Um, you can solve this one by hand. Uh, you can find the zeros by setting your equation equal to zero. This is where the position would be zero right there. So um, negative 16t squared plus 16t plus 32 is equal to zero. Uh, factor out a negative 16. So you get a positive t squared, a minus t, and a minus 2. And you can factor that, t plus 1, t minus 2. And so you get t equals negative 1, but for our problem, t is not allowed to be a negative number because t is uh, time measured in seconds. So t equals 2 is the one we want there. And that's where our, our 0 is located. Okay. So average velocity. So this is going to be the position, change in position over change in time. So the position is S. That's our function up here. It's called S. All right. So we're going to do S of 1.5 minus S of 1. And that's going to be divided by 1.5 minus 1. Change in position over change in time. Okay. Position. Let's see. They gave us some. Position of the diver in the water is, uh, all right, uh, 32 feet. So position's in feet, and T is measured in seconds. So this is going to be feet on top divided by seconds on bottom. All right, and so those of you all have done some physics, you know velocity is in a measurement like this, feet per second. All right, so that makes sense. Our, our, our units are matching up. Okay, so we're going to type this into the calculator. So I'm gonna do a uh, calculator page. Nope, not what I wanted, control doc, calculator. So I'm gonna hit control divided by, give me a fraction. And then um, I can type in F1. Okay, that's my position function, that's S. In the calculator, it's called F1, parentheses, and then put in the number I want. So 1.5 minus F1 of one, and then divided by 1.5 minus one. There's my answer, negative 24 feet per second. All right, now this is going to have us do a table where we do a bunch of average velocities just like that. And what you can see is that we're letting the average, um, we're letting the time interval get closer and closer and closer to one from the left side. And then we're letting the numbers get closer and closer and closer to one from the right side. Okay, remember when we did our limits unit. Limits have to equal the same number coming from the left and coming from the right. Same is true for derivatives. They have to be the same value from the left and from the right. And if they are, then we can say the derivative exists and it's equal to whatever that number is. All right, so we're going to do that same formula, but I'm going to plug these numbers in right here. All right, so I can just arrow up and copy that down by hitting enter. And so I'm going to do F1 of 1 minus F1 of 0.9, and then this is going to be 1 minus 0.9. All right, so negative 14.4. Okay, copy that, and I just need to change my 0 0.9 to 0 0.99. Negative 15.84. And change it to... 0.999, negative 19, negative 15.984. All right, and then do the other side. So 1.1, uh, 1. I'm going to start on the very right of our table and work our way back in. All right, and also you don't have to do it in this order. You could have done one first and 1.1 second, as long as you do one 
minus 1.1 on the bottom as well. I just like putting the, the bigger number first just because it, it really doesn't matter at all. All right, negative 17.6. So that's this one over here. And then I'm going to work my way in. And I'll need to oops, add a zero in here and here. Negative 16.16. .16. and negative 16.016. <clears throat> okay, so remember with this method, all we're doing is estimating um, what the limit would be equal to by using the table. All right, we could get even closer if we just add some more nines on this side, or if we add some more zeros on this side. But I think this is good enough to be able to tell of what you think the, the limit might be. All right, for me, it looks like the, the numbers are approaching negative 16 from the left and the right. So we're going to say the instantaneous velocity is approximately equal to negative 16 feet per second at t equals one second, okay? All right, so last problem we're going to do, um, we're gonna find a derivative, um, which we haven't exactly done yet, uh, using our definition of derivative, um, and then we're going to use that derivative to do a couple things. Okay, so first thing they ask us to do is just sketch the function and a tangent line at the point x equals three. Okay, so if we're going to sketch this, um, I think I want to find the zeros. So we can factor x times x minus 4. So we get zeros at 0 and 4. So I'm going to plot those 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, and then I'm just going to plug in the numbers in between, 1, 2, and 3. So if I plug in 1, I'm going to go back to my original. I would get 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. If I plug in 2, I would get 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. If I plug in 3, I would get 9 minus 12, which is negative 3. Okay, we knew it was a parabola because we saw the equation, and our points are certainly going a parabola shape like this. All right. Okay, now I need to draw in a tangent line at x equals 3, so that is this point right there. Do a different color. There we go. All right, so my tangent line would kind of go like this. Okay, it's supposed to be intersecting that point and that point only. I'm drawing this by hand, so obviously it kind of looks like it's intersecting there, but it's not. All right, it's intersecting at this point and that point only. Okay, based on your sketch, do you expect f prime of 3 to be positive or negative? Okay, so remember, derivative means slope. So what this is asking is the slope of your tangent line at x equals 3, is that slope a positive or a negative? Okay, well, we just drew it. Certainly looks like that has a positive slope the way we drew it. All right, now we're going to compute f prime of 3. Um, it says three different ways. Uh, you only see two here. It used to be three, but I changed it. So that should be two different ways. All right, so we're going to use the definition of derivative. So this is the original definition of derivative. I'm going to come down here. This is part C. And this is uh, problem number one from part C. Okay, so the definition of derivative is the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. All right, our f of x, I'm going to write it again right here, is equal to x squared minus 4x. Okay, so what this means is you're going to plug in x plus h everywhere there's an x. All right, so that's going to look like this. The limit as h approaches 0 of parentheses, and then I'm plugging in x plus h, where x goes, squared, and then minus 4, parentheses, and again, I'm plugging in x plus h, where x goes. Okay, so that's f of x plus h right there, and then we have a minus, and then we have f of x, so parentheses, and now I'm plugging in f of x right here. And then all of that's over h. Okay, so if we were to plug in 0 right now to try to solve this limit, I would get a 0 over 0. All right, x plus 0 is uh, x squared minus 4x minus x squared plus 4x. Everything cancels out, 
and then obviously a zero on the bottom. So we have a little more work to do to solve this limit. And the work we need to do is just some algebra. We need to multiply this out. So this is going to be the limit as h approaches zero. Okay, multiply that out. This is one that's worth just memorizing how this works. It's a perfect square. You get x squared, you get 2xh, you multiply them together, multiply by 2 in the middle, and then you get plus h squared on the end. Distribute the negative 4, minus 4x, minus 4h. Distribute the negative sign, minus x squared, plus 4x, all over h. Okay, so the only way that we're going to get an answer to this limit is if uh, we're able to cancel this h on the bottom. The only way that's going to happen is if everything on top that does not have an h attached to it cancels out first. So this term, I have an x squared, so that has to cancel with something. Otherwise, we didn't do something right or the derivative doesn't exist. Okay, so x squared, and I do see a minus x squared right there. So those two can cancel out. All right, see how that has an H attached to it? That one's going to stay. This is an H. That's going to stay. This does not have an H. Minus 4X. Yep, plus 4X. Those are going to cancel. And then we have another H here. So let's rewrite our limit as H approaches 0. 2XH plus H squared minus 4H all over H. Okay, now this is a common denominator. All right, I'll go live. All right, so these all have an H attached to it. I'm gonna do an extra step here that I don't normally do, um, that I would not encourage you to do in the future, but just to be very specific about what's happening here. So we're breaking this into three limits, okay? and we're gonna break it up at this plus sign right here and at this minus sign right here. So we're gonna have the limit as H approaches zero. And so this is a common denominator to all three terms. So this is gonna be two XH divided by H. Second one's gonna be the limit as H approaches zero of h squared divided by h. Third one's gonna be minus the limit as h approaches zero of four h divided by h. Okay, and then now we should be able to evaluate these limits because the h is cancel. And then there's nothing to plug zero into because I plug zero into h, I don't plug zero into x. So you can think of two x like a constant in this problem because the variable is h. So the limit of a constant is equal to the constant. All right, right here, um, this H cancels with one of the H's, so I can just cross out the exponent, but I'm still left with one H. So if I plug in zero, I get zero. Minus, and in this one, the H's cancel, and I'm left with the limit of a constant, which is equal to the constant. So this whole thing is equal to 2X minus 4. Okay, remember what this limit is. This limit, the original limit definition, is equal to F prime of x. So that's what our answer down here is equal to. f prime of x is equal to 2x minus 4. 2x minus 4 is the derivative of x squared minus 4x. All right, now this doesn't answer the question. The question was actually compute f prime of 3. So now that we have an f prime of x, we can simply plug in 3, f prime of 3, is equal to 2 times 3 minus 4. 6 minus 4 is equal to 2. And we're done with that one. All right, now they asked us to do it a different way. So back up, we're going to do the alternative form. This is the, the one with the C's involved. Okay, so remember that your, your, your C is a constant. And in our problem, we have a constant, 3. So C is equal to 3 for our alternative form of the definition of derivative. All right, so this is uh, problem number two for part C. So this is the formula. Limit as x approaches C of f of x minus f of C over x minus C. All right, f of x is equal to this, and C is equal to 3. So let's rewrite our limit with everything plugged in. The limit as x approaches 3 of f of x, which is this, x squared minus 4x minus f of 3. All right, I'm just going to write it like that for this first step. All over x minus 3. Okay, now f of 3 is just a number. It's actually the y value. And we already found that earlier. It's, it's this number. So this is this right here. This is 3. So this is f of 3. And f of 3 is equal to negative 3. 
All right, so let's rewrite it again. The limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 4x minus negative 3. All right, and so we have a double negative right there, so we can uh, turn that into a positive. Okay, so don't forget about direct substitution. Try to plug it in. 3 squared is 9. Minus 12 is negative 3. Plus 3 is 0. 3 minus 3 is 0. So this is a 0 over 0. But we have a quadratic. I think we know what to do with that. We need to factor. So we get x minus 3 times x minus 1 over x minus 3. The x minus 3s will cancel out. And we can just plug in 3. 3 minus 1 is equal to 2. And that's our answer right there. Okay, so remember that this limit up here is equal to f prime of c. So when we rewrote it with our numbers plugged in, this limit is equal to f prime of 3. And so once we've worked it all out, that means our answer down here is equal to f prime of 3. Okay, now I showed a couple extra steps that I wouldn't normally show, all right? You don't need to write the formula every time. I'm doing that because it's our first time. Okay, this f of 3, you should have been able to, we found that already. And so I would kind of like skip to this step right here. Just write that down, do a factoring, plug and plug it in, get your answer. And so if you're trying to find f prime of a number, derivative at a point, like I said on the front page or the back, the last page, um, this way is much better, right? Using the alternative form. All right, because if you use the original definition, you, you're going to have to go through this whole process every time, and then you still have to plug the number in at the end once you get the answer. This one gets you straight to the answer, exactly what you wanted, f prime of 3, with minimal work. All right, we didn't have to do a whole lot there to, to get there. So anytime you're finding the derivative of a number, derivative at a point is what we say for that, um, you want to use the alternative form. If you're finding the derivative function, which is this right here, then the um, formal definition of derivative is uh, most helpful there. Okay, so last thing, we are going to write the equation of this tangent line that we drew right here. All right, what is the equation of the tangent line to the graph of y equals f of x at x equals 3? We're going to leave this in point slope form. All right, now I'm going to rewrite this um, using some calculus notation. This is what you learned in Algebra 1. It's great, all right? But let's plug in, we're going to replace the y1 and the x1 and the m with things that we know from calculus. All right, so y minus, and so instead of y1, we know that y1 is the y coordinate of this point right here. Um, and that's negative 3, so we'll, we'll eventually have the negative 3 in there. But what I want to put is f of 3 right there. All right, and then equals, and then slope. Well, slope is our derivative. All right, remember, we wrote it right up here on part B, f prime of 3. That is the slope. So instead of writing an m, let's write f prime of 3. And then parentheses, x minus, and then x1 is the x coordinate, which they give, it, give us to, gave to us in the problem. All right, so now let's plug in the actual numbers. So we know that f of 3 is negative 3. And we know f prime of 3 from what we did down here is 2. Clean up my double negative right there. Y plus 3 is equal to 2 times X minus 3. And we are going to leave our answer in point slope form just like that. All right. Hope you enjoyed our first day of derivatives. And I'll see you on the next video.